This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. Hey everybody, this is Freddie Cohen of ESPN Radio. When I'm not talking about breaking news or breaking news on ESPN Radio, I'm always a fan and listening to the Detroit Sports Podcast, and so should you. Thanks, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the Detroit Sports Podcast. This is our one-on-one special podcast where we get a chance to invite those that we find fascinating in the world of Detroit sports, have a chance to get their story, get some inside info regarding the work that they do. And Josh Katzenstein, friend of the podcast, you've heard him on previous editions, joined us here in the Sterling Heights studio. Welcome, Josh, and I'm glad you came. Yeah, thanks for having me. We do this podcast where we just kind of get some background information of those working in sports, whether it be in radio, whether it be in print, whether it be media. I love doing this podcast. I get a chance to talk to those working in the field and getting some exciting news and doing doing some great work. Did you always think that you would work as a reporter growing up? I don't know. And uh, I must say, though, it feels weird being on this side of the table, but uh I always wanted to do something in sports. Ideally, that would have been uh, the first baseman for the Atlanta Braves. But since that fell through because I'm unfortunately uh, Jewish and for that matter, not athletically gifted enough. In high school, I just sort of uh, started looking at, you know, the idea of becoming a, a reporter because I was the kid whose, you know, parents like whenever I'd watch sports, my parents would always just be like, oh, my God, he said exactly what was going to happen or exactly what the commentator said. So I always wanted to, you know, be Al Michaels or something like that. But then, you know, I worked on the newspaper staff for two years in in uh, high school, uh, you know, just the journalism class or whatever they called it. And then uh, when I got to college, my sophomore year in Minnesota, I joined the paper staff there, spent a year doing like local news, you know, what businesses were coming to uh, campus and, and things like that. And then I moved to sports for my junior and senior year. And then really, I mean, after my junior year, working, you know, I was the sports editor of the Minnesota Daily, but I I also covered the football team, covered the men's basketball team. So I got a chance to, you know, see what it was like to be a full-time reporter, basically, even though I was still going to class. And at that point, I realized, you know, that this was something that I was passionate about. I really thought that, you know, I could, uh, you know, find a career in at a newspaper, even though, you know, obviously there were questions about the future of the industry. But, you know, I got an internship at the Detroit News after my junior year of college uh, on the sports desk. Then after I graduated, they brought me back to the city desk. So I, I turned that into a full-time job, spent a year doing that, and then they brought me back to sports, and now I've been there for four years. And um, it might not be exactly what I had planned, but it's definitely worked out so far. So growing up as a kid, you grew up where? Um, I was born in New Orleans, um, and then when I was about eight years old, I uh, moved up to Minneapolis. So uh, it was way too cold. It was January when we moved. And uh, apparently I'd only seen snow one time, but I didn't remember because I was so young. So I remember, I mean, I'll never forget when we were driving up to Minnesota, uh, I think we got to like St. Louis or something. And I said, mom, what's that white stuff on the ground? And little did I know that when we got to our house in suburban Minneapolis, there would be like six feet of that on the ground because uh, was it winter of 96? Yeah, winter of 96, 97 was one of the worst in Minnesota history. And apparently we had just missed like all the 60 below days, but there was still plenty of snow on the ground. So uh, that became a big part of my life moving forward. What were your early sporting memories of, of events that you go, wow, whether it be a shocking loss or a great victory? Who were your teams growing up and what were some of your early sporting memories? See, I hope, no offense to you, I kind of hope too many people don't listen to this because <laughs> I've sort of kept that under wraps um, just because... I think people know that I'm not a big like Detroit sports homer by any means um, just because I didn't grow up here. And I think that helps me do my job and and be unbiased for the most part. But um, growing up, I was an Atlanta Braves fan because I was in New Orleans, which I mean, Braves are the team of the South. They were on TBS, so I could always watch them. And they were really freaking good, man. Like, I mean, Greg Maddox, Tom Glavin, John Smoltz, Chipper Jones was always my guy, David Justice. Well, I was a big fan of David Justice and uh, Fred McGriff, obviously. I mean, those teams were loaded. Um, and then I actually went to preschool with Bobby Hebert's son, so naturally a Saints fan as well. Um, and then, you know, I liked LSU uh, football. For some reason, I liked Florida football too. I think it was because of Steve Spurrier. And then uh, there wasn't a basketball team. Um, oddly enough, I liked the 
Charlotte Hornets because one of my like childhood friends moved from New Orleans to Charlotte and there wasn't a team in New Orleans at the time. So I started cheering for the Hornets and then they moved to New Orleans after I was already in Minnesota. So I kind of like the Timberwolves because Kevin Garnett was amazing, obviously. Uh, Stefan Marbury back in the day, uh, you know, Latrell Sprewell. I mean, they, ha- they had some really good teams when Flip was there before he came to Detroit, obviously. And then um, hockey, oddly enough, I was actually a Red Wings fan growing up because I was actually just talking about this. I was on the Sports Cave yesterday and Darren McCarty was on and they're talking about the alumni game, you know, this week in Denver. And and they were asking me, like, Josh, you didn't grow up around here. Did you know about that intense rivalry? And I'm like, yeah, of course. Red Wings were the best team on NHL 99 and N64. So I always played as the Red Wings. So started liking the Red Wings. But hockey was never my thing. I was more of a basketball guy in the winter, uh, even though I lived in Minnesota, because I just never got over, um, you know, my distaste for the cold weather. And, and it seems odd to me that you would take a perfectly good building and put a sheet of ice in it. <laughs> But uh, outdoor hockey is definitely fun, and uh, I'll play a little bit. Broomball was a big fan of Broomball in college, too, but um, I'm trying to think. It, I mean, nowadays, like, the more I cover sports, it, it's harder to be, be a fan, honestly, just because once you're in there and see how the sausage gets made, like, I just watch sports differently now, and it, it's kind of frustrating. Do need to give a shout-out to my Golden Gophers, though, because I went to Minnesota, and uh, big upset against Maryland last week, so we'll see uh, if that means anything. I'm sure it won't because they had a really bad year, but... Hey, a win is a win. Now, being a baseball guy and a fan of the Atlanta Braves, what stands did you take? Now, I know they won the division so many years. They were the class in the National League, but they only won that one title. So you have people who will say, well, the Braves were great, but they maybe should have won more. Or were you just like, you know what? I got a team that can compete night in, night out, and can be, you know, atop the division, has a chance each and every year. What was your take on those Braves back in the 90s? Well, I mean, that was it. I I mean, it was really appointment viewing with that team. I mean, just because... I mean, people here think about the Tigers and, you know, when they had Verlander and Scherzer, but I mean, they basically, they had three Hall of Fame starting pitchers. They had a couple Hall of Fame hitters. And I mean, they were just a, an amazing team to watch. And it was incredible that they were nationally uh, broadcast pretty much every night. So, I mean, I loved it. And I mean, it obviously sucked that uh, they didn't win it, more titles um, when they lost to the Yankees. Uh, it, my parents are both Yankees fans. So that one was tough for me. But uh, I remember watching one of those games at a friend's house and his dad got us like pizza. And then after the Braves lost, we watched the X-Files, which is a really odd memory. But uh, that that's one. I, I didn't answer your question about um, sports memories, but that was definitely one of them. Um, going to a Saints game at the Superdome, going to a Vikings game at the Metrodome. I was never a Vikings fan. Oddly enough, a lot of Lions fans seem to think that I am just because I grew up in Minnesota and they think that, oh, he must, you know, like the other team in the division. But my mother... <laughs> Uh, hated Randy Moss, hated Randy Moss, would not let me like anything about Randy Moss. Cause uh, the one, I mean, he, he had a couple off field things where, you know, he ran over that uh, there's a street cop that he ran over with his car. And then, you know, he talked about, you know, he'll pay or he'll shake it up. You, you, you know, we all know. So that was sort of off the table. Although I did run into Randall Cunningham once at the airport with my grandmother and we were in an elevator and she like nudged me to say something. So that was a good early memory. Then actually I saw the Braves play at the Vet uh, in Philly, which was a good one. I got Ryan Klesko's autograph that day, so um, that was fun. And then uh, another baseball one, watch Ken Griffey. I was waiting for his autograph at the Metrodome after they played the Twins, but then he like raced off in some, you know, black like Suburban or some some big SUV with all tinted windows so you couldn't see him. And I, I was disappointed, but it was still cool to be that close when you're younger, you know. As a young kid in high school, college, did you do a lot of reading? Did you follow the sports in the newspaper back in the day? Yeah, I did. Like I said, I I didn't really think about working for a newspaper until later in high school and, and really seriously until I got to college. So, I mean, I read the paper. I mean, you know, we were a cultured family or at least attempting to be a cultured family. So it was there every day. And, you know, I'd, I'd always just pick up the sports section, basically, and, and see what was going on. And uh, Minneapolis has one of the best papers in the country. The Star Tribune is really good. Uh, they have a lot of good sports writers there, especially while I was growing up. So, yeah, um, I didn't think about it at the time, but definitely reading that probably helped, uh, you know, me find my voice later down the road. And uh, I mean, they didn't have a ton of success when I was growing up, the teams in Minnesota, but um, they were always fairly exciting to watch. The Vikings had a couple good years. The Twins had a couple good years. And um trying to think the wild weren't there yet, but the Timberwolves were pretty good for the most part too. And actually one more uh, good memory ran into Kevin Garnett on mother's day. We were at a restaurant and this big dude apparently walks in and my sister 
like points at me and she's like, Hey, uh, is that guy like a football player or something? I turn around, I see Kevin Garnett wearing this gold visor and I'm just like, that's Kevin Garnett. And this was in 2004 when he was, uh, he eventually won the MVP and, and there was the big, uh, you know, campaign for him to win it. So, uh, that was a pretty good one too. Do you feel like now you've looked back in your career, do you feel like your education that you got really helped you in your early work in the field of journalism? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Um, I actually didn't want to go to Minnesota at all. I was going to go to Mizzou. Uh, I wanted to go to Northwestern. My sister went to Northwestern. Uh, I thought it'd be really cool to live right by Chicago. And obviously they have one of the best journalism schools in the country. But I got a uh, I got a scholarship to Minnesota, the Evan Scholars program. I don't know if you know what that is. It's, uh, it's, a, cat, it's a scholarship for golf caddies. They have it here in Michigan too. It's at most of the Big Ten schools. Uh, it's a, if you caddied at least two years and meet the financial and – uh, educational requirements, you can get a full ride. So at that point, once I got that, I, I didn't really have a choice and I went to Minnesota, but it, it ended up working out perfectly because uh, like really my last three years of college and, and particularly as a junior and senior, I had two amazing professors that worked in the field for a long time. One was Chris Eisen, who worked at the Star Tribune for a while, won a Pulitzer Prize there, uh, uncovering uh, corruption in the St. Paul Fire Department. They were basically just they, they were just doing all this arson, burning up these houses, and then collecting the insurance money, you know, through back channels. So, uh, you know, learning from him was great. Paul McEnroe was another longtime uh, reporter uh, at the Star Tribune. He was actually still working while he was a professor. So that was one class that I willingly got up for at eight fifteen. Uh, in the morning, even though I tried to avoid those for the most part. But yeah, with with those guys and a couple other professors, um, I mean, they really just showed us how to be reporters. You know, they weren't just teaching from a textbook. I don't even think we had a textbook in either of those classes. And uh, it definitely worked out for the best. You are working in the field, um, working currently at the Detroit News. Tell, tell everyone that's listening what you currently what your current role is at the Detroit News. Uh, Lions beat writer. It's pretty much that simple. I, I cover the Lions all year and everyone asks me, you know, what do you do in the off season? But as you know, I mean, there's no off season. I have to go to the combine tomorrow and I'll be there all week. And then, you know, next month there will be owners meetings and free agency, you know, is something that you have to be watching pretty much every day once it starts, even before it starts. And then the draft, uh, I mean, between the combine, and the senior bowl, that basically takes up, you know, two months of the off season and then off season workouts start training camp starts. So, I mean, yeah, it's a, it's a full year uh, duty. What's interesting is that you did an internship at the Detroit News. You didn't take the job right away after the internship. Talk about your experience in uh, the Detroit News as an intern. What kind of roles did they have you do? What kind of experiences did you have as an intern? Uh, it was actually amazing. The internship uh, was better than I expected. I remember the first day I showed up, uh, there were a few interns, and, and we've unfortunately unfortunately haven't been hiring interns the past couple of years mm -hmm. just because of budget issues. But it was a paid internship, okay. which was hard to find, obviously, in the field. But the first day I showed up, there were three other interns. They all went to their respective sections and to their editors. I walked back and, and uh, talked to my editor. He's like, hey, you can go home. We'll talk to you on Wednesday or something. Because the following weekend was uh, the NASCAR races at MIS. So I ended up covering like every aspect of that. I think there was an ARCA race. Uh, then there was like a nationwide race maybe. And you know, I ended up talking to Brad Kislowski. A bunch for that. Obviously, at the time, this would have been two thousand summer two thousand ten. So he was still just cutting his teeth, really, on the bottom tiers of NASCAR, and ended up getting you know really big. But I followed him around not only at uh, MIS, but uh, he had some events that summer that I came out to. I think in Sterling Heights, uh, you know, around his hometown, and and then after that, like and that weekend, it, it's really hard. I I ended up covering Lions training camp a bit, some Tigers games. Uh, you know, I did some stuff with the colleges, Michigan, Michigan State. Uh, I did like state softball championships, but it was really hard to forget that first weekend because it was so clear immediately that they just wanted me to be a reporter. They didn't they didn't treat me like an intern at all. Basically, they just said, you know, go out here. There were a couple assignments that they wanted something specific, but for the most part, I had a lot of freedom um, and they wanted me to write as much as I could. Basically, Evander Holyfield was the. There, there were two races, and I covered both of them that summer, so I always get them mixed up. But for one of them, Evander Holyfield was the Grand Marshal, and I ended up, you know, talking to him about Mayweather and Pacquiao. And I had, like, that was the biggest story on our website that day when I wrote that he said they should fight. And 
And these are just simple things. And it made me realize like, okay, maybe I do have good ideas. Maybe, you know, this is something that I could do uh, as a career. So uh, yeah, it was a really great experience, and, and I was excited that they wanted me back. Okay, good. Now, in college, are you starting to formulate some goals for yourself as a career in journalism? Did you think, okay, maybe I can take these stepping stones to a, you know work at a very large paper, or did you have smaller goals and wanted to work up? How did you start formulating how you wanted to progress in this career? I don't know that I ever really thought about it, honestly. Mm-hmm. I was fortunate that I was working at a really good college paper. Uh, people don't think about it. it. It doesn't come up now, but one of the years that I worked there, our paper was uh, the best college paper in the country, according to the Society of Professional Journalists. So, uh, I mean, it was a really great experience. We, we operated like a lot, like a normal newsroom, like of a big paper, uh, at least from my experience so far, because it was all student run. You know, we all had to come up with our own ideas. You know, I was editing pages, other, other students were designing everything and we had to come up with new stuff every day. I mean, it was a daily, you know, five days a week paper uh, in college. So I mean, it was a lot of hard work. And then in my head, I always wanted to work for a big paper, obviously, or, or a magazine or something. But, you know, once I got the internship at the Detroit News that, that summer before my junior year or the summer after my junior year, I applied for like a 100 different newspapers just looking for any opportunity. And the Detroit News was the only one that got back to me, oddly enough. So took that and ran with it. And then once I got that experience, then I started doing uh, more with the Star Tribune in addition to my work at the daily, uh, I did some, I, they had a, a class. It was a practicum class where you were basically a student intern. So, uh, for the first, uh, semester of my senior year, I wrote a lot about prep sports for the big Minneapolis paper. And then second semester, they basically had me on as a full-time freelancer covering the, uh, Minnesota women's basketball team. So between those experiences, I felt like I was ready to, you know, go to a big market and, and contribute right away. And then, you know, I got the chance to come back to the Detroit News and I ended up spending a year on the Metro desk, which was obviously much different than uh, what I'd been doing in sports. But as I as I said, you know, that experience uh, with those professors really prepared me for that. Now, a lot of people who listen and download this one on one podcast are younger people who are just maybe working in the field or are interns or are those who are just very new to uh, the field of journalism or sports media. What advice would you give those that are young, that are maybe just beginning or are in internships to help them maybe avoid some mistakes or to help them to be the best journalist that they can be? Okay, the best piece of advice I ever got was to listen. Just listen. Uh, I was talking to Dan Wetzel, I'm sure you know well, um, and lives around here. Fortunately, you know, I've gotten to uh, talk to him a few times. He's one of the guys I, I respect the most for sure. Uh, incredible columnist at Yahoo and and great author too. But I was talking to him and he was telling me the story about how he was, uh, you know, covering the Olympics and he was at a press conference with, I think the women's uh, soccer team. And I don't remember exactly what was said, but he said, you know, one athlete, one of the, one of the women said something and everyone just sort of ignored it. But then he like brought it up and it ended up being a, a much bigger story once he he talked to her, uh, you know, either later that day or the next day or something. And really, like since he told me that I've started to, you know, do that in my work uh, because, you know, there are a lot of times where Jim Caldwell will just answer a question, you know, and, and put a few different things in there. But everyone will focus on the immediate, you know, whatever the big news is, whereas uh, I think one particular example of this was uh, when his first year, uh, he was talking about uh, low cost for high cost for low living. And I like asked a couple of players like what he meant by that. And I found out that, you know, every day or every week, maybe Caldwell does this slideshow where he shows, you know, different athletes who have gotten into trouble and, and what the consequences ended up being. And, and I, it might not have been a, nearly as popular of a read as anything about Calvin Johnson or Matthew Stafford. But I thought it was a pretty interesting story, and, and and that's whether it's a small interview or especially a press conference. That was the advice there, um, just you know, because a lot of things get overlooked in press conference settings. But other than that, I would say just write. I mean, the best way to get better as a writer is to write. Reading helps too, obviously. But I think you know the best way to to find out how good you can be is to actually do it, and then to find people who you respect to uh, get critiques from because. Like I said, those two professors that I had in college, I mean, they were, I was already working at the college paper, so they were really hard on me and I really appreciated that. So don't be scared to talk to your professors, ask them uh, 
to help you out and uh, it, the good ones will. So definitely do that. Now, after your three month internship, you now start working as a freelancer, which is an opportunity for you to kind of go do your own thing and able to maybe shop around your work and potentially cover the things that you wanted to do. That's not actually how it went. Mm-hmm. So uh, after I graduated, I did the freelancing while I was still in college. Okay. And then after I graduated, I got an internship back at the news on the Metro desk, though. Okay. So I was I was really worried that I was going to be unemployed and, and, you know, working as a freelancer after college. But uh, things worked out for me because um, the news brought me back. Um, oddly enough, I had a friend, one of my uh, college friends who worked on the college paper with me. He actually turned down that internship uh, because he had just gotten done with another one. And then after he turned it down, they called me. So I spent three months on the Metro desk and then they hired me full time. So didn't have to spend too much time as a freelancer, thankfully. Yeah, I I was going to say, I was going to ask, you know, did you start to feel a little bit of pressure? Because coming out of grad school for me, I waited about six months in terms of applying and looking for situations. And so after a while, you're like, okay, I got a degree. I feel like I can, I can, I can do the job, but it's just that patience you need maybe just to get that first job. And that first, people always say that first job is always the hardest one to really kick off your career. Yeah, no, I was nervous. Actually, I graduated without a job lined up. Um, so yeah, that's, my head was on the freelancer thing. I was actually, so I didn't really have like a traditional job at all growing up. Like I never worked at a restaurant or anything, but for some reason I always thought I'd be good at it. Uh, cause I caddied for nine years. So I have decent social skills. Like someone actually told me this and, and it's weird cause, uh, yo- when I was younger, I used to talk a lot, but now like that I've gotten older, like I try to just like, you know, stay in the background a little bit, which is why it actually works out better that I work at a newspaper as opposed to TV. I always, I, my plan was if I couldn't find a job in journalism, just to 10 bar or be a waiter at some fancy restaurant and then freelance where I could. But, uh, I think it was like 10 days before the internship started that summer that they called me and said that I could come back to work on the Metro desk. So luckily, luckily my, uh, my bartending skills will have to wait. I'm not a journalist. I didn't get, I get trained in it, but I'm very fascinated in the field of the, of the job that you're in. And, uh, really I started kind of not what you say critiquing, but really looking at the field in the beginning of 2015 with the story of Jim Harbaugh. You have Jim Harbaugh coming to town potentially from San Francisco, and you have really two distinct kind of reporting going on. You got the national reporting who's you know going with potential sources saying that Jim Harbaugh is going to take an NFL job, and you got local media here in town saying, okay, well, we have some inside information that he is going to come. So I'm looking at both sides, and I'm looking at kind of who's reporting what and things like that. What was your take the beginning of the year 2015 with the whole Jim Harbaugh story. Well, I was one of the people who thought there was no no way he'd be coming back to Michigan. Um, and that's not just because a lot of national NFL reporters were reporting that. I just thought that when you get a job as a head coach of the San Francisco 49ers, you're never going to leave it. And based on what he had done his first three years with that team, I couldn't envision any way that he would get fired, you know? And and then so many other things would have to fall in line, like Michigan would have had to be bad under Brady Hoke that year, which they were. Um, and then the 49ers would have to be so upset with uh, Harbaugh. And there were some, you know, inklings that that was the case, that there was some infighting with him uh, and the, you know, ownership. But I just I just couldn't see it happening. And then even even once it got into, you know, late in the season, November and stuff, it became clear that Hoke was going to get fired. I just didn't think like I said. Coach for the San Francisco 49ers, I know a lot of people don't necessarily see them as an elite team, but they're one of the best franchises in the NFL. They're one of the most successful franchises in the NFL. So I feel like that's a job that once you're in it, you're not going to go anywhere until you're forced out. But then oddly enough, he gets forced out. And once he did, it became quite clear. I mean, why would he go take a lesser job in the NFL? Because once you, I feel like once you realize that there's all that political bs going on in the league that if it can happen with one team it could happen with every team and i feel like in college there's just as much you know political stuff going on but i think as a college coach you can control it a lot more and there are a lot more people that are worried about pleasing you as opposed to you pleasing them and so i think it made a lot of sense for him to just come back home as it were as opposed to going to miami or whichever you know openings there were at the time 
Yeah, and so in terms of coverage, though, you know, you can see some of the national guys were relying on sources. Yeah, yeah. What's been your experience with sources and source reporting? Because on my end, okay, you look at it and you go, okay, I understand that this is an information business, but people have agendas. People have, you know, you know, sometimes the, the information gets changed as it's being reported. Have you had pretty much a good relationship with your sources? And do you believe that source reporting is a viable option nowadays because of, there's, so, there's such a vast array of information that sometimes if a source is wrong, you're putting your credibility on the line? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and that's why I try as hard as possible not to use sources. And that's something that I was taught in college. I mean, you should only use anonymous sources if it's really important and if if it's a big enough story that it warrants it basically and it's so funny because i feel like from the moment i heard that as an idea everything just got thrown out the window because you see people report things according to sources that are like already out there as public knowledge and it's like no like what do you like you don't have to say sources after everything and if all of your sources uh, refuse to put their name on something, I feel like that's a problem. So I have a big issue with the way a lot of national reporters handle things. Now, I respect a lot of them. I mean, a guy like Adam Schefter, he's never wrong. Um, there are plenty of other you know, national NFL reporters that are never wrong. I mean, for the most part, I mean, Jay Glazer, if he, if he, if he reports something, it's always right. Adam Kaplan's a guy I respect a lot, uh, also at ESPN. I just think that, you know, it's a, it's a really big issue. And it has little to do with the reporters. It has more to do with the sources because in the NFL, everything is such a big secret. And it, it's mind boggling to me because it's football. I mean, we're talking about a game. Now, the game is obviously worth billions of dollars. But at the same time, why does the assistant, you know, the running backs coach, when he says that Marshawn Lynch is going to be out for six weeks because he's got such and such injury, why can't he put his name on that? Like it doesn't hurt the Seahawks. Like if Marshawn Lynch isn't going to be on the field, that's going to hurt them more than other teams knowing that he's hurt because they're going to know that he's hurt when he's on the practice report. And when he doesn't come to the game, like it just doesn't make any sense to me why everything has to be covered up, but that's just the way the business is. And um, I think a lot of local people have tried to, you know, avoid going that route. It's just that uh, the NFL in particular is so big now that, Anything that any source says is basically a, a, a story. But yeah, you, you sort of just have to know who to trust when you're building sources. And, and really, I don't, I don't quote a source unless I know they're right. That's my thing. And I've gotten into trouble. Like I broke that, um, that Joe Lombardi was fired um, back in, in October. And that's a thing where if I don't report it, I know one of my competitors is going to. So I tweeted it out. And then I immediately I got a call from my editor saying like, hey, you can't tweet that unless, you know, you tell us who your source is. I'm like, yeah, but my source is right. So back off a little bit. And then there are other times where the opposite could happen where like, I, I know I got some flack for the, um, uh, when, when Gil Brandt said there was going to be a search firm, uh, that the Lions were going to hire, uh, for their president and GM search. And I still, I still believe that that was going to be the case. I think when the story came out of which firm it was going to be, there were some uh, confidentiality issues that, you know, maybe the Lions didn't want to work with them or maybe they didn't want to work with the Lions. But, you know, that's that's neither here nor there. But when that ended up being wrong, I could say, well, Gil Brandt was wrong, you know, not that that makes me feel any better for writing a story that ended up not being true. But it's not like it's my sources who are anonymous. It's not like I was reporting something or making something up. Someone was willing to put his name on it and he was wrong. But there are so many times where these anonymous sources are wrong and then nobody knows who's wrong. And, you know, you basically look at what happened in Philly. There was all this stuff about Chip Kelly. You know, every day there's a story. Chip Kelly's doing this or DeMarco Murray's doing this or LaShawn McCoy's doing this. And then they're all calling each other liars when really it's these anonymous people and, and you just don't know who's saying it. So it's frustrating for me, but uh, it's just part of the game. I was going to ask about some challenges in your work, but and you also led me into another aspect of your work. The biggest relationship that a reporter has is probably with his editor as well in terms of, you know, making sure that you guys are working together and that maybe you don't take some things personally if some things are maybe edited in a certain way or you're given constructive criticism. What's been your relationship like with your editors, you know, so far in your career? Uh, it's been really good. So how does that process work? I mean, you sub, uh, how, what's the, how's the process work where you submit your article to the paper and it gets into print? 
Well, basically, I'm in constant communication with my editors, um, and that was the case, uh, you know, on the Metro desk. You know, when I was in the office, you know, we'd just be talking all the time. And um, now that I'm in sports, I don't go into the office as much, but you know, I'm always on the phone. We're exchanging emails. So for the most part, you know, either on like Monday, we'll try to create a plan for the week or something, or you know, day if there isn't a plan for the week, pretty much in the morning, I'll talk to my editor about what I have or what I'm going to go do, um, or if he has any suggestions of what I should do. And there's a few. So my main sports editor at the news is uh, Phil Ashura. So for the most part, I deal with him, but there's some assistance when he's out and really everything just runs smoothly. And I don't know how other reporters do it, but I mean, I might talk to an editor a dozen times a day and that might be a little bit too much, but it's just, it just helps me knowing that we're on the same page. And then, you know, if anything changes, whether it's a story change or if something that I was writing has become a bigger story as or not as big of a story, it's just important to keep them updated. And then if for some reason, you know, my story is not going to run or, you know, like a lot of times something will happen where I go to Lions practice on Thursday and I had this plan of the three stories that I'm going to write. And then Jim Harbaugh says something. All of a sudden, that's our big sports front uh, on on the cover. So then my plan might change. So then they're calling me. But yeah, I think I think the, the most important thing is just to have an open line of communication with your editors so that, you know, you're always on the same page. And there are definitely times where we disagree. But uh, I think when you talk as much as I do with mine, you know, those things go away rather quickly. You start off at the Detroit News. Are you around the time where, the, where, the, where there's the Internet? Yeah. OK. And so now you see that not only is there you know, the ability to get information from the newspaper. But now you're starting to see a little bit more coverage on the internet. And now sitting here in 2016, there's so many more websites out there that provide information. What's your opinion on blogs and other types of information that sometimes are trying to cover sports, trying to give opinions and also trying to, you know, you know, generate revenue or do those type of things? Uh, First of all, I should say on the, uh, the editor thing, I think the internet is a big reason that we talk so much because Mm -hmm. If there's a story that breaks, I have to get something up there as quick as possible. So I have to make sure that they get it. Sometimes they'll call me to make sure that I heard about it. So um, that's one reason, uh, you know, the Internet is definitely a big part of uh, how we operate on a daily basis. And it has been really since I've been in the field, um, which I think was probably fortunate for me. To your question, it's hard to say because there are a lot of good bloggers out there. And there are, frankly, there are a lot of journalists who have become bloggers and and gone off and and started their own thing. I think for me, there's an issue with, and it's not just sports blogs, it's blogs about pretty much everything. And and that's one, maybe it's because I work, you know, on Metrodesk, like I don't really disassociate like sports news and and regular news. I think it's all covered the same way uh, for the most part. But my biggest issue for blogs is that there are a lot of people out in the public that can't um, decipher. Yeah. They can't decipher between what is a news story and what's a blog. And now there are definitely a lot of, I don't want to say a lot, but there are definitely some reporters and some outlets that get a lot of things wrong. Again, not a lot, probably shouldn't say a lot, but there are, there are plenty of trained journalists that get things wrong or, you know, stir up phony stories and things like that. But I think for the most part, when it comes from the New York Times or the Washington Post, you know, it's going to be accurate. And I'd like to think that's the same case with the Detroit News and the Detroit Free Press. But when someone is just stirring stuff up on a blog, you could post pretty much anything you want. And then if you have a following, people are going to believe it because it seems like it's coming from a credible source when really it's not quite as credible. Now, like I said, there are plenty of good blogs. There are blogs that I read all the time. I mean, look at Deadspin. Deadspin was effectively a blog when it started, but you know they, they built a following. And uh, now I think it's probably one of the more trusted outlets in the industry. And that's been the case with a bunch of blogs. I just think that it's definitely dangerous that people have such access to all these blogs. And I think the bigger issue, and I really should have said this from the jump, before there wasn't access to all this stuff. There were when, you know, in the 90s, you would get a newspaper delivered to your door. Maybe you'd get a newsletter uh, from, I don't know, a writer you follow or something interesting. And then you'd get magazines. And that would be the news that you read. And you know that it was all from credible people. Then, you know, you'd go out and you'd talk to people and you'd hear other things that were just rumors. Now those rumors are on the internet for everyone to read. And they're like, like you said, it's hard to decipher between, you know, what is news and what's rumor. So I think that's the biggest uh, challenge with blogs. But yeah, that that got kind of long winded. 
And uh, the challenge is sometimes, and the reason why I kind of looked at blogs too, is that you have you know guys like Bill Simmons who are the rare individuals who start off a blog, work really hard at it, but are really talented, and they build a following. So now you have a lot of other people thinking, okay, I can be a journalist when they haven't gone to school. They haven't, you know, really learned the, you know, the ins and outs of the business. And so that's why I was fascinated with your opinion, because you got a lot of people who are not trained reporters trying to do this thing and really kind of some are getting successful. And I don't think you have to be trained as a journalist Mm -hmm. to be a journalist. I just think that when you've worked at a newspaper and once you once you learn how to be a journalist, you don't you don't have to go to college and get a journalism degree by any means. I, I know a lot of people that say a journalism degree is the worst degree you could get to be a journalist. I don't agree with that. But, you know, a lot of people think that it's better to you know learn more about a topic than just how to be a reporter. I just think that working around people who know how to report the news and, and seeing how basically in, in journalism, you get told no a lot. And I think that's a big issue. Like if I could come up with a story idea, if the story idea is bad, my editor will just tell me no. I've written stories and maybe the sourcing isn't good enough or maybe it isn't a big enough trend. Whereas if I was working for a blog, there's no one there to tell you no. It's basically just up to you and you can just post whatever you want. I think that's a big problem. But yeah, a guy like Bill Simmons, I'm a big Bill Simmons fan. I know uh, a lot of people might disagree with that, but I, I, I've listened to his podcast for years read him obviously can't read him now but i read him more you know back in the day not quite as much um anymore really since since he switched over to grantland and i love grantland but his this is a perfect example because his content just got way too long once he got to grantland it's like he was his own editor and so now he had no filter and and that's really what we're talking about because you need a reporter's best friend is his editor because he's going to tell you when you're writing too much when you're not writing enough when you need to talk to more people And with a blog, when you don't have that, it's hard, uh, you know, to be sure that you're doing everything the right way and producing the content the right way, producing the facts the right way. So I think that's my biggest issue. But I mean, George Hunter, uh, the the cops reporter at the Detroit News, he didn't even go to college. Um, And I know there are plenty of other, you know, reporters in the industry that, you know, I'm sure were like high school dropouts, even that if you know how to report the news, you know how to do it. It's just uh, to me, it means more when it's coming you know, with with that right masthead, you know, of uh, something that's been around for 100 years. Okay, so now in your field, in your work, how are you rated? Because in the past, in the newspaper business, you'd look at subscriptions. Well, now in the internet, you have, you know, reads and things like that. And there's a word thrown around that a lot of people talk about and people that come in here and and when when things are kind of put out there, the word is clickbait. People say that sometimes there's some people out there that may just throw out ideas to generate clicks. What's your thoughts about that? And, and in your work as a writer, how are you rated that saying, okay, this is an article that a lot of people received well, a lot of engagement. How do you judge uh, the work that you're doing? How is that presented to you? It's a good question. I'm trying to think. I don't know if I've had a performance review, really, like a sit down, you know, let's uh, circle the four out of five or whatever. I think for the most part, it's, it's at least in my paper, it's a combination of, it's not clicks first. Like, I mean, by any stretch, because there are a lot more things we do some slideshows, but if we really were all about the clicks, we'd do a lot more slideshows. There are plenty of websites that do that. Um, but I think it's a combination of, first of all, just presenting good stories, being accurate. Accuracy is really the most important thing in a newspaper, or it should be. And you know, if you're running corrections all the time, then you're not going to be in the field very long. So accuracy, um, ability to meet deadlines is hugely important, especially now uh, with the internet, because being first shouldn't be the most important thing, but for a lot of people it is. And it, being right, as I, that's why I mentioned accuracy first, but if you can be right and be first, then, I mean, that's exactly how you win the game. Uh, beyond that, uh, clicks do matter, obviously, um, but I don't have, I've never had an editor call me and say I'm not getting enough clicks. Um, it might just be that I'm fortunate enough to cover a sport and a team that is going to generate clicks no matter what I do. I mean, I'll never forget Opening day two years ago for the Tigers, Matt Stafford gets engaged. That's the number one story on our website. So I've been lucky that I haven't had to, you know, no one's ever said that I'm not getting enough clicks. So I think I do get plenty of clicks. But yeah, clickbait is an issue. But at the same time, like, I don't know. I think it's an issue because it's a buzzword more so than it's actually a problem. It's it's a problem when it's wrong. If someone writes something that's wrong, like we were talking about the sources before, you know, if it's wrong or if it's faulty in any way, that's the bigger issue. But when you look at a newspaper 10 years ago, 
look at page two of a sports section. There's all these rumored stuff. You just got to fill the page. So I don't know that there's a big difference between page filler and clickbait stuff. It's just that it's easier to access that now. So are you able to, maybe if you had an ego, look to see how many people are reading an article that you put out? Yeah, I could. Okay. Um, I do like at the end of the year, like, you know, we get stuff, you know, here's our highest, uh, you know, most read stories, most read, you know, things like that. Um, And I get them every day, but I just, to me, the metrics don't matter. And that might be really cliche to say, but it's more important for me to write good stories. And, and I'm fortunate enough that, you know, if I do find a feature that I can sink my teeth in, I can't do it as much as I did a couple of years ago. Um, when I was the like number two guy on the Lions beat, you know, I, I couldn't, you know, now if I'm, uh, if I'm working on a feature and, and Calvin Johnson retires, like I gotta, you know, worry about that for a week. But that, I think that's the good thing. Like, I think the best story I probably wrote last year was a, a feature on, uh, Glover Quinn. And that might've gotten like five comments on our website compared to, you know, something I wrote last week, Mike Mayock talking about the defensive tackle talent in the NFL draft. That might be 10 times as popular, but it's not as good of a story. But I'm just glad that I still have the opportunity to write that because, you know, people always say if you touch one person or, or something along those lines that, you know, you've, you've done your job. So I don't know if that's uh, exactly the case, but it's definitely important to put out good stories more so than just the clickbait, as it were. Yeah. What's been your favorite story to write or present? Uh, or some of your same, or or if you don't have the one or some of the more important ones that you can recall. The most important story that I wrote was when I was on the Metro desk. And, and oddly enough, uh, a few of the most important stories I did. And, and maybe that's just because I haven't had the opportunity to write like a, you know, obviously things happen with like Titus Young and stuff, but, you know, maybe there just haven't been, you know, the scandalous stories that you would expect. Uh, so when I was on the Metro desk, uh, I don't know if you remember, there's a 101 year old woman who got evicted, uh, in Detroit a few years ago. So channel seven broke that. And I was, uh, you know, the GA guy that day. So I went out to the house and, you know, talked to the son, things like that. And then over the course of that next week, you know, I kept talking to different people and I talked to a guy who worked at HUD and he told me, uh, the end of that week, he said, you know, we promise that we'll get her back in her house. So then I was covering another assignment. Oddly enough, um, it was the death of a three-year-old girl who died in a fire where uh, the fire department, they, the family thought, didn't come on time. It was on the east side of Detroit. And when I was there one day, someone told me that the woman, uh, Texana Hollis, uh, who had been evicted, was still not in her house. And this was uh, maybe, it was like six months later, maybe five or six months later. So I called, you know, my guy at HUD and, you know, Basically, he said, yeah, she's she's not in there, went by the house. She was still living with this, you know, woman who she knew through church that was uh, taking her in. So it ended up being a story about federal government lies to evicted 101 year old woman. And I mean, it was a huge story, man. It was like one of the top stories on, on Yahoo after it got picked up by AP. Tyler Perry called this woman offering help. Someone from Afghanistan called offering to help. And then eventually Mitch Album ended up buying her house uh, through his foundation and repairing it so that she could move back in. But, uh, I mean, you just sort of saw the the power that a newspaper can have. I think a lot of people forget, you know, that because you're not holding the paper nearly as much. So you don't have that morning coffee experience of, you know, spitting something out of your mouth because such a big story is happening. But, uh, yeah, it, it was I didn't set out to help this woman, but it ended up being. Uh, that that's what happened. So, I mean, that was definitely the most impactful story I had. Well, kudos to you, man. That's really yeah, nice. Thanks. It's really nice because you do, you do realize the impact that you do have is that if you, as a reporter, you can uncover some things maybe that aren't going as well and maybe the, the ability to follow up with the story. A lot of people could have just said, okay, the, the, you know, the information was presented to me, but you, you had the courage to ask and, and it actually it helped out. So that's very nice. Kudos to you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm trying to think of other ones in sports. Like there have been a bunch, like none that stood out. I wish I had some like award that I could fall back on. But um, I mean, just a lot of them or even in college, like I got to do, I, I freelanced for the frozen four because after my internship, my junior, the summer before my senior year, during my senior year, Michigan hockey was in the frozen four in St. Paul. So I got to cover that for the news and they ended up making it to the championship. And it was, it was incredible just to write stories about that team, uh, you know, all weekend. And then uh, at, after they lost in the championship, I think it was to Minnesota Duluth. It was either Minnesota Duluth or North Dakota. I don't remember. I don't like either of those teams because I went to Minnesota. But 
I talked to Red Berenson, you know, in the locker room for like 45 minutes after that. And, and as like a 21 year old, like those are really neat experiences to fall back on. But yeah, best stories. Like, I mean, that one really stands out. I really enjoyed writing about Lawrence Thomas when I was still in uh, college, when I had an internship and he was at uh, Detroit Renaissance. I went and did a big story on him because it, it was, uh, it was uh, the main story for our uh, high school football preview because at the time he was playing every position for his team. He was the punter. He was the kicker. Uh, you know, he played a lot of uh, linebacker, but he could play defensive line. He was a running back at times. He could be tight end at times. So uh, that was one thing that stood out. But I mean, at this point, it, it, it's bad to say, but I write so many stories now, you know, in a, in a week, if I write 20 stories, you know, it's hard for me to a find one that I was so proud of because I had enough time to work on it or, or B just remember it you know like there's just so many things that happen on a daily basis so i wish i had more for you and the reason why we came in touch because we've started to hear you on the radio um the ticket doesn't do a whole lot of interviews nowadays but from time to time when news breaks regarding the lions we hear you on the ticket we hear you on detroit sports 1051 hear you on uh, radio stations in grand rapids do you enjoy being someone that uh that sends out information and gives a lot of stuff regarding the lions do you enjoy do you enjoy being a reporter that kind of is now popular and gets to kind of present information about our Detroit Lions? I do, except that it leaks into my social life. You know, that that's the one issue. Like, I pretty much accept a, a radio interview anytime I'm available because, you know, if it's 10, 15 minutes out of my day and, you know, there are people that, you know, want to hear this information, you know, that's something that definitely uh, I think is helpful. But uh, I think the bigger issue is, you know, when I'm hanging out with my friends and all my friends around here are Lions fans, so they want to know what's going on. It's just like I need a break, you know. Um, so that's my one issue. But, yeah, I definitely uh, like getting on the radio. And all the guys locally, you know, have definitely been a big help. And I think it, it, it's weird because yeah, everyone talks about how, you know, radio – I don't know if people say radio is a dying industry. But I think it, people just think of it so old school and now there's podcasts. But radio and newspaper – newspaper it's hard to gain popularity and i don't need to be you know some face like i don't get recognized when i'm out on the street thankfully um and and i don't need that but yeah it definitely uh helps if i can you know put out information on the radio and uh definitely uh thankful to you know people at 97 one 1051 uh you know some stations out west too so uh it's definitely uh helped in my career yeah now when you survey the landscape in your work unfortunately 2015 wasn't all a great year for a couple uh, a couple large writing organizations Fox Sports yeah. has downsized recently. M Live has kind of downsized a little bit. You, when you talk about the field of journalism and writers, a lot of people are a little bit concerned where it's going. Do you have a little bit of fears about writers and, and the whole craft of journalism now? Because you know it's really hard to say. Well, how are you monetizing this? How is this going to be a viable business? A lot of people are looking at it and going, "Are newspapers a dying business?" I'm not fearful, just because I think people are always going to need information, and whether that information comes in a newspaper or on a website or something else that, you know, we haven't thought of yet. I, I think it goes back to what we were talking about bloggers. Like people are going to need accurate information forever. And I think that when you've built up enough goodwill as a lot of the newspapers have over the past 150 years, however long they've been in business and same with magazines and things like that. I mean, the magazine industry is hurting too. Um, I, I, I think there will always be a market for that because it's critically important that, you know, we can hold people accountable, whether it's in politics or uh, in sports, whatever the case may be. So I'm not worried because I think there's always going to be those opportunities. But yeah, I mean, there's there's definitely issues in it and it's frustrating to see what happened. You know, I think there was 21 or 23 layoffs at MLive. We just lost a bunch of people a couple of months ago. Uh, back in December, we had some uh, buyouts, you know, some really lost some really talented people. So um, yeah, it's tough to see all of that happening. And, you know, we don't know how long the Detroit News is going to be around because, you know, there's the joint operating agreement and, you know, there will be uh, talks about that coming up in the near future, I'm sure. But whatever the case may be, whether it's all online, I I'm sure there will always be uh, people that need news. So your work with the Detroit Lions has been fascinating the last couple of years as it's evolved and some challenges that you have faced. You shared a great story with us regarding Indomitian Sue and the challenges that you had covering him. And the reason why I want to talk to you about it is because uh, I'm a fan of Hard Knocks. I watched that show. And this year, I really got into the Houston um, Texan story. And what was fascinating was there was a, a segment in that show where Bill O'Brien is having a meeting, and he's, t he's basically telling his team, the media is the enemy. 
and he's basically role playing with them, teaching them how to give canned answers and basically giving scenarios where I'm going to ask you about your teammate. Please tell me the proper response. And you had a tough time with Ndamukong Sue, and now you're working as the Lions beat writer where you got to go in there and talk to these guys. Do you feel like the attitude is us versus them? Absolutely. I wish it wasn't the case, but I know that uh, whether it's Lions coaches or Lions PR people, they're telling them that we are the enemy because people have told me that. Players have told me that. Um, you know, there was one player last season, uh, it was in the second half of the year, and I went up to him and, and he's like, no, nah, I can't talk to you. I'm like, why? And he's like, he's like, because you're just looking for the best story. Like, you don't care what I have to say. And I'm just like, no, that's not true. And he's like, he's like, but isn't it true that you're looking for the best story? I'm like, yeah, but like, I'm not going to make something up. Like, that was his thing that, you know, if I if he said something that I might twist it around. Um, I, I don't know uh, if you've heard about this at all. And I don't want to, uh, you know, pee on his grave, as it were. But Stephen Tulloch was incredibly difficult this season. He maybe talked to the media once since the start of the season because it was a combination, I think, of him being frustrated about how he got hurt uh, in 2014 and then adjusting to his diminished role uh, on defense. But yeah, he might have talked to the media once and, you know, him and I uh, got into, it wasn't a heated exchange, but, uh, you know, I sort of, you know, said something, probably could have said it in a less rude way, but just about him not talking to us because uh, it was the day his um, children's book came out. I went up to him. I was like, hey, man, you haven't talked in a while. Like, maybe we can talk about this. Like, you know, that's something that, you know, he might be interested in promoting. And and that's not my job to promote his children's book. But if that was an avenue for us to start talking, then maybe it could, you know, lead to, you know, some good football discussion and just career discussion because we want to know what the hell is going on with him. But can I curse on here? Anything you want, man. Oh, man. I, I wish I had asked that beforehand because I keep – I said it's good BS to earlier. Yeah. No, no, no. I, I don't need to. Yeah, well, now, yeah. now that I know I can, I'm probably not going to. Mm-hmm. But uh, but no, I said something to him. He, he's just like, no, no, no. Like, we're good. And I'm, I said back to him, I'm like, no, no, no. We're not good. You're good. And another player, like, overheard that and thought it was, like, the rudest thing in the world. And it's like, look, man, like, I got a job to do. I understand if you're frustrated about some other stuff and and if there's a reason you don't want to talk, but I think one of the biggest problems in at least sports journalism is that there aren't open lines of communication because we are viewed as the enemy. So if I write something that's wrong and, and God forbid, I want to know about it. I want to know why it was wrong, what was wrong about it. But instead of you know a player coming up to me and, and correcting me or saying that you know I need to fix something, they'll just they'll think that I'm out to get them or something like that. So, yeah, I think it's a big problem. And um, I know Jim Caldwell is, is not helping our case locally, but he's not the only one in the NFL that's trying to keep everything a secret. So it's hard to say. But, yeah, it's definitely a big issue. And and I think we are at times viewed as the enemy, which is why I'm so grateful to certain players you know, who are constantly available. Glover Quinn gives us a half hour every Wednesday. Daryl Tapp will talk any day of the week. Nate Burleson, when he was here, would talk – for an hour if you needed him. So um, those players are great, but uh, it, it definitely gets frustrating at times. So during the 2015 season, did you become a committee member of the Dungeon of Doom media in the Detroit uh, Lion media? Because Jim Caldwell, you know, in 2015 season, was probably a little bit uncomfortable uh, feeling like he was on the hot seat, maybe because the questions were definitely direct and to the point regarding some of his decisions. And some of his answers were deflected and not to the point. And he comes out and he says, you know, this this vibe in here is like the dungeon of doom. Did you maybe take that a little bit personally, or did you did you how did you receive that when he said that in the press conference? I didn't take it personally because I know that I've said worse things about him uh, behind closed doors. So, and I'm sure he said worse things about me behind closed doors. So, uh, I didn't take it personally. And maybe it helped that I wasn't there because uh, that was right after the London game, and I was fortunate enough to stay in Europe after that. So I remember you know getting back to uh, the place where I was staying and. You're pulling up Twitter and seeing the Dungeon of Doom, and I just laughed because, A, we're not the Dungeon of Doom. Uh, We're just doing our job. And even though his point, I think a lot of people immediately said, well, you're one in seven, so the questions are going to be hard. And that's definitely part of it. But his overall point was that we've been so negative really since he got here. But you got to earn the chance for everything to be positive. I've written a lot of positive articles about this team. Even when they were losing, you got to find ways to balance everything out. I just thought it was odd that he said that. And really, I think it it hurt him more than it hurt us, you know, 
Because people, whether from Twitter or just being a reader or listening to the radio, I think a lot of people make up their minds about reporters, whether they're negative, positive, whatever. Um, but I think when you see that a coach maybe can't handle that pressure, and I think a big a big reason he said that was because you think about where he's worked before. He worked in Indianapolis, and for his entire 10 years there, Peyton, besides the last year, Peyton Manning was a quarterback. So there was never anything negative to say. Then, you know, you go back to when he was at Wake Forest, he's in Winston-Salem. Like, that media is not going to be incredibly hard because Wake Forest is the biggest thing in town. Uh, you know, he was at Tampa Bay for a year, uh, Penn State when Joe Paterno's there. So maybe he just hadn't experienced, you know, what it was like to be on a team that had only known losing, that had a rabid fan base. And I think that's the bigger issue than anything, that A, he didn't know what it was like to be in a town where there was going to be that negative, um, I don't want to say, uh, you know, purview, but uh, there's definitely expectations are high here because people have always failed to meet the expectations. So I think everyone's skeptical immediately. And that's actually what Rod Wood said uh, when he was on the radio that, you know, until we prove something, I would be skeptical too. So I think that's maybe something called, well, that he didn't understand, but uh, at the same time, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I'm just going on and on. Yeah, yeah. So teams are trying to control the message a little bit more and more, and athletes are trying to regain control too. Now you see Derek Jeter starting the Players' Tribune where you got content there. You see you got these teams that are running websites, DetroitLions.com and things like that. Do you find it difficult to continue to do your job knowing that potentially you might not break as many stories or that you may not be given as much information as other reporters who are working with the team directly or now athletes who want to just put the message out themselves? Uh, yeah, it's definitely a problem. And I'm trying to think there's not really, I'm torn on the Players' Tribune. It's definitely frustrating. And, and I can't imagine being like a Mets reporter and asking Matt Harvey questions point blank. And then one the next day, he's answering them all in a Players' Tribune article. But, you know, I have to deal with that in a, in a similar way with DetroitLions.com because there are players who would rather talk to someone who's only going to ask them softball questions as opposed to someone who's going to ask if they got in trouble off the field and things like that. I mean, just look at, you know, the way uh, that website wrote about, you know, the pursuit of Indomitian and Sue, like the, in the entire season uh, before he was a free agent, everything was amazing. Everything about Sue was incredible. And, and a lot of it was warranted. He had a great season, but I mean, it, it was such a clear thing to me that they were just trying to bring him back. And then the other thing that really frustrates me is that, you know, they'll say, uh, Someone told, like a player told DetroitLions.com. It's like, I say that in a story when someone gives me an exclusive. Like, you know, if someone told the DetroitNews.com a breaking story, like that's when you say, like, that. that's when you brag a little bit. When I'm talking to a coworker, like if I'm talking to, if I talked to, I talked to Wojo earlier on the phone, I don't tweet out like, you know, Wojo told DetroitNews.com. That's exactly what it is. Like they're coworkers. Now, you know, Tim Twentyman, I don't need to name him by name, but Anyone he talks to who works for the Lions is his coworker, and mm. obviously they have different jobs. But when you say according to sources, and your sources are your coworkers, it just doesn't make any sense to me. And that's something that is definitely uh, a frustration. I try not to think about it as much, but yeah, I just try to do good work and break stories where I can because between the team wanting to build their brand on their own website, and you know all these national reporters breaking stuff with the sources, as you said. Uh, I mean, I just try to break things where I can, but it's important to me that if I'm not breaking stories, that I'm pushing the stories further once they are broken. Um, so that's sort of how I deal with all that. Yeah, and now see some talk has come out regarding the Lions, regarding maybe their involvement with 97 won the ticket and maybe calling them up and trying to maybe challenge what's being said or maybe try to maybe manipulate or confront some negative things that are being said. Now, you're a credentialed media with the Detroit News. Do you feel like you're able to ask questions freely in a way that's comfortable? Or do you feel a little bit of pressure like, if I ask this question a wrong way, I could be talked to or maybe even excluded? Do you ever feel that kind of pressure? Or are you just able to, you know what, ask the questions that I want to ask and whatever happens, happens? Whatever happens, happens. I mean, I'm, I'm a uh, ask for forgiveness, um, not for per permission kind of guy. Me too. Um, just because... If I'm not if 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 we're not asking the right questions, and actually I made this point to a player uh, at the end of the year, I was talking to Riley Reef because Riley Reef never talks to the media. One because he rarely has anything interesting to say. Two because he's shy. But he was telling me that you know he's waiting in the locker room for 45 minutes or an hour after every game, and no one ever comes talk to him. He said the only person who ever talks to him is Jim Brandstatter. Uh, you know those old linemen always stick together, and he's like. 
he's like, where do you guys go? I'm like, oh, I have to go talk to Caldwell. And he's like, you've talked to him after every game. I'm like, yeah, because if I'm not there, I don't know that the questions that need to be asked are going to be asked. And I think that's, I, I started saying this at the end of my long winded one of many uh, Caldwell questions, Caldwell. And I, I made this point to him because before the season started, it was during training camp. I asked him if Joe Lombardi was still calling the plays because Joe Lombardi's first year did not go very well. And there was speculation if Caldwell might, you know, be more involved with that or something. And he looked at me like it was such a ridiculous question. And he said that he's like, why would you even ask that? So he gets off the podium and I told him, I said, Jim, sometimes I need to ask a question just to hear you say yes or no, because I don't want to find out in two weeks from Ian Rappaport that, you know, Jim Caldwell is now calling plays and Joe Lombardi, you know, whatever the case may be. So I don't think I've ever gotten in trouble for asking a question. Now, if I write something, that's when I've, you know, get emails from the Lions saying like, hey, you can't do this. I've had my credential threatened a few times. You have? Yeah. But okay. it's definitely not about the questions. Now, that's something that I think it, asking tough questions is something that's definitely gotten me and a few other reporters, you know, on, on the wrong side with Jim Caldwell. But yeah, I'm definitely not scared to ask tough questions because like I said, if, if I don't, I don't know that they're going to be asked. And even if I don't write about them, you know, we just got to know uh, what's going on. Now, this may be a tough question, but you know, between you and yourself, have you ever questioned or thought maybe if I played the game a little bit more or if I was maybe more willing to present things from the side of the Lions that maybe you could get more access or maybe advance your career in that light? Have you ever thought that, you know what, this might be a losing battle and that if I just maybe played the game and befriended some of the guys in, with the Lions in that sense, not to, you know, challenge your ethics, but have you ever thought, you know what, if I just played the game, maybe I could advance myself with this with with uh, the, with the Lions. The catch more flies with honey approach. Yeah, uh, you actually you just asked me a question that I think people with uh, Lions PR have asked me as well. And to answer your question, no, um, okay. because I don't have any obligation to the team. I don't have an obligation to show the good side, and I think that I do a pretty good job of that. Like, I mean, I wrote. I think I wrote a pretty glowing. I, I've written glowing stories about players that I knew we're going to get cut next season, because if you don't write the good stuff now, when are you going to get a chance to write it? And, you know, I don't do that to pump guys up. I do that because there are a lot of good stories out there. And, and that's the bigger frustration with, you know, us being treated like the enemy, because I do just want to go in and find good stories. I don't care whether those stories are about good things or bad things. I just want to find a good story. I'm just like, I mean, I have a good relationship with plenty of the players in the locker room. There have definitely been some things that I did that I, I, regretted but so what you're saying to me is that the someone from the Lions PR has kind of said hey if you kind of ease up a little bit yeah we could pot potentially yeah, yeah do yeah. something with you well no 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 no, no, no. Oh, okay, not okay. that okay. okay so yeah yeah uh, my initial response should have been that I never see it from that perspective because okay. I don't think there's anything to gain now when you're building sources it's definitely important that you know you can you know befriend them in some ways you don't have to be friends mm -hmm. but you know if you can relate to them. That's the best way to develop sources. But I don't think writing something positive or writing only positive things is going to get me more access because like we talked about, there's the lines.com people, mm -hmm. then there's the national people. So it's not like if all of a sudden I only ask nice things to Jim Caldwell, I'm not going to get invited up to his office, you know, every Friday for an exclusive interview. So I just don't see the benefit to doing that. I just want to do my job and, and really, and this is the third time now that I've tried saying it. I, I'm sorry, I keep forgetting. Um, like when Jim Caldwell says that I'm asking, you know, two tough questions, he doesn't say that, but if people think I'm asking too hard of questions, I'm not asking them for myself. I'm asking them for the public. I'm asking questions that the public wants to know, because if the public wants to know why George Wynn got a handoff at the goal line, when Joyke Bell is standing on the sideline, when Amir Abdul is standing on the sideline, they don't have a chance to ask that they could tweet it to George Wynn. But George Wynn's not going to respond, so I have to ask Jim Caldwell that, or I have to ask Joe Lombardi that. I have to ask Terrell Austin, you know, what went wrong on the Hail Mary, and just because they don't give up, they don't give a good response, or they don't give any response, that's their right. They're totally entitled to do that. But someone has to ask that question on behalf of the public, and really, that's the most important thing that we as journalists can do. And I think sometimes that gets forgotten because people think that I'm just out there doing self-serving things, but that's just not the case. Josh Katzenstein, you can follow him on Twitter, at Jay Katzenstein. He's a good follow. He's a good reporter. You can read his work, DetroitNews.com. Covers the Lions, and the reason why I like having guys like Josh in here is that he gives it to you straight. 
I believe that he covers the Lions in, in a fair way possible. And that's the number one thing you can ask for a journalist is to be fair and give us some good coverage. And you've been a friend of the podcast. I appreciate you coming in, sharing some inside knowledge regarding your work. And uh, we always get the guests out of here on this one question. You got four tickets. You can go to any sporting event, any venue in the world. You can take three people with you, dead or alive, friends, family, athletes. What event would you go to? What would you like to watch? And who would you take with you? Oh, that's tough. I'd really like to go to the World Cup, honestly. Uh, But I don't know if I'd rather go to the World Cup than the Olympics. Honestly, I'm into so many different sports, man. Like, I I played a lot of tennis growing up. I played a lot of golf growing up. You know what? I think it has to be the Masters. And I would just bring three of my buddies because I have a couple friends that every year, you know, apply for the Masters lottery and then they never get it. So I'd bring my friend Billy, my friend Kevin, and then... If my friend Justin ever listens to this, he's going to be upset that I didn't include him because, uh, you know, they all we all hung out together in college. But I feel like I got to bring someone interesting. That's tough. I'm looking. I'm looking at a wall full of Detroit stars, so that's not really helping me out. I think it would have to be Chipper Jones, man. Mm-hmm. He was always my favorite athlete. Like I'm thinking about this way too much. So yeah. you know what? No, Greg Maddox, because I think as much as I'd like to hang out with Chipper Jones. The stories I hear about Greg Maddox are just incredible. So I'd go to the Masters with two of my friends and Greg Maddox, and I think we'd just have a ball. Thank you for coming in, sharing your stories one-on-one on on the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. Josh, I appreciate your time. Yep, thanks for having me. And uh, sorry if uh, too many of those questions went long. No problems at all. I always say when you're having fun, time flies. We blinked. Hour and ten minutes just flew by, man. Perfect. See everybody next time on the Detroit Sports Podcast Network.